Hello and welcome to Art Insider. I'm Peter Nagy. On today's show, we're going to talk, talk about sculpture, but not just any type of sculpture, specifically sculpture that uses found objects. That's real objects taken from real life that the artist chooses to make into art. But if we're going to talk about this type of work today, we're going to have to go back to how it all started. And that takes us to a man named Marcel Duchamp. He was a French artist working in Paris at the beginning of the 20th century. Mostly he was making paintings, but at a certain point he decided to start taking common household objects and put them in the gallery and simply call it art. His most famous work of this type was entitled Fountain, a common urinal bought in a plumbing supply store, turned on its side, put on a pedestal, put into an art gallery, and voila, you have art. Of course, this was a scandalous maneuver at the time. But Duchamp's gesture opens up a whole new way of not only thinking about art, but making art. That art doesn't have to be something an artist makes. It can be something an artist chooses to call art. It also is the beginning of conceptual art as we know it. The, the idea is the important thing, not necessarily the object. So this way of, of making sculpture is now 100 years old and has been practiced by many different artists over different generations on their own terms and in their own ways. So today we're going to talk to a number of Indian sculptors who choose to work with the found object. And we'll meet them in both their studios and at their exhibitions to find out why they find this type of art making so relevant. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you became aware of the Duchamp's ready made? Actually later. People yeah. start quoting me sometime, the Duchamp, uh, uh, and then I start looking at mm -hmm. it because I didn't study uh, history in my mm. college of art. Mm. So you so didn't know about it? I didn't know about it. We read about it in textbooks, but it was all quite far away, Peter, to tell you the truth. Like, whatever it's you encounter. It's the other side of the world. It's the other side of the world. <laughs> This week on Art Insider, we're talking about the found object in sculpture. We've already seen how this all started with Marcel Duchamp, but while found objects proliferate throughout sculptural practice in India today, many people still seem baffled as to why this can be art. To learn more about this, we'll start with the master of the found object himself, Mr. Subodh Gupta. Sabod sort of made his name and still his, his, some of his most signature pieces and mediums are the stainless steel pots and pans, the Bartons of India, um, which when I first saw Sabod's work, I think the first piece with the Lotus was what, about 97 or 98? Yeah, 90, uh, 98. 98, 98 was the first piece using the Bartons. 98 I made it, 97, but 99 I exhibited in Kemola Art Gallery first time in Mumbai. And that was the first piece using the stainless steel Bartons Absolutely. in the circle yeah, with the yeah, Lotus. Yeah, yeah. And then everything came yeah, yeah. from there. Mm -hmm. And the first time I was saying, this is about the first time I saw that piece in the studio, there was just a, um, a recognition that this is the kind of art that should be coming out of India now. Um, it was a very simple device, um, the stainless steel Bartons, which you find in just about every Indian home. Um, it was something that he's grown up with, most Indians have grown up with, but it also had an international significance. It played into the history of the found object, um, the history of pop art, the history of arte povera, and these movements. But Sabod was taking those histories and making them his own, really indigenizing it, making an Indian version of these things. So it didn't look like a copycat thing at all. It looked like something very vital. Also, I liked that these things talked of the class system in India, because these are very much now, especially 20 years after that work, even more associated with the common man, the Am Admi, the lower classes, because the upper classes want real china dishes and things like that. In my conversation with Sabod, the one thing we have learned is that objects used by artists are not randomly selected, but have very specific meanings. 
Objects have meaning. Objects are from the real world and they're used for certain things. So they will always carry that meaning. They're designed for certain things. These being surgical instruments, they're sort of gruesome. Um, they are to open the body, to cut apart the human body for surgery. But at the same time, they're also healing devices. They will cut the tumor out. They will, you know, deliver a baby, things like that. So they're, 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 they're double-sided things. They look menacing, they could be weapons. Many of them are sharp and menacing, but at the same time, they are instruments of health and recovery and things like that. Um, and so the artist has juxtaposed these, this field of these instruments with a gun. You know, perhaps guns make these necessary, guns to, uh, cause damage that these things correct. So all of those, uh, those connotations, all those meanings are already here in these objects and all you have to do is, I mean often people will say, well what does it mean? Well the simple fact is, what do surgical instruments mean? Everybody, it's, it's maybe about found object sculptures taking a step back and just looking at the, the meaning of objects and that would be the use of them but also the sort of psychological underpinnings, what they resemble, how we feel about them. Sometimes, the objects that make up the sculpture are meaningful because they have been a part of the artist's life. A very powerful work in this regard is that of the sculptor Anita Dubey, entitled Silence, Blood Wedding. The starting point for the work was a human skeleton, which has autobiographical significance for the artist. My father was diagnosed with cancer, and so in the atmosphere in the house where we were, where death was impending, um, I asked my mother, where is the, the sack of bones that my brother was studying medicine with? And she says, it's in the storeroom. Well, to back up, because your parents were both physicians. They're both physicians. And so your father absolutely. had in his office a human yes, skeleton. Yes, yes, absolutely. And so I started to look at each piece of bone and was amazed by how amazing that form was. So it was such a, this work is such a mix of actually my appreciation of the form it's a found object, it's a dead skeleton, but then really making an effort to combine the, all the pieces in different ways, almost like a trousseau, uh, a kind of a wedding trousseau, which is why it's called Silence Blood Wedding. And I thought I was making it for a girlfriend of mine, but actually, my father was dying at the same time, so it's it's a it's very uncanny. Well, the viewers who don't know the work might be perplexed because what Anita's actually done is encase each actual human bone with a skin of red velvet, and then add it onto that with beading and embroidery. So it's almost like jewelry. A lot. It is it. because you know I wanted to make it as resplendent as I could because I was actually fighting death. So I was wanting to pull in the direction of life, like each little object, like a really glowing, most beautiful thing that I could possibly do at that time. And, and take and this, this vocabulary yeah. of embellishment, of jewelry, yeah, and much. celebrate the human bone, the, 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 the symbols of death. Yeah. This work by Anita is heavily loaded with meaning, but only a few people could understand it when it was first made. Also, as it uses human bones, it became rather controversial. Controversy is something often associated with sculptures made with found objects, something that Sabot Gupta knows all too well. Often, people who encounter his works find it difficult to understand why they are art. Um, this is a real favorite of mine, and this is a sculpture called Ata. So again, I know when this is shown in galleries, it really, it stops people because they're like, huh? Mm -hmm. They just, they, A, a lot of people don't even see it as a sculpture, and then people are very perplexed, well, what did you do? What did the artist do here? They, this is not real Ata dough, this is? Bronze. This is bronze, amazing. Yeah. This, this is bronze. This bronze was made in Switzerland, right? Yeah, this bronze is made in Switzerland mm -hmm. because there's nobody able to cast this bronze in yes, India. Yes. And we were having a big trouble to how to cast the uh, Atta. Uh, uh, so, uh, but they, what they done, I asked them, how have you taken the mold of the Atta? They did, uh, uh, they put in the freezer and freeze the Atta. Ah, and that's how uh, to make become, it they were able to make, make the, the mold. Yeah, uh, the mold I love of the that, 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 yeah. that 
that change between something that looks completely like nothing, like just a blob, that anybody could make this blob, but actually, technically, it was a very, very difficult bronze yeah, to, yeah, cast, yeah. to cast, to get the texture of it and all these little crevices. The beauty of Sabaud's sculpture, Atta, lies in its simplicity. Just because it is simple does not mean it was easy to make. Another good example of simplicity in sculpture is by the artist Pushpamala N. You may look at this circle of wooden chapels and think, why is it so simple? I think the power of the work is in its simplicity. Um, it's sort of the most simple type of shoe that has ever been designed. Um, and what's nice about it is it's a shoe in the shape of a footprint. So it's both shoe and footprint. And going into the circle, so this idea of, of the, the yatra, the, the, the path, the march, the circularity of that march, the never-ending cycle of the march, the search for something. A lot of the times I think work such as this is, is, is important and valuable simply because of its simplicity. Um, the artist knew that it was powerful enough just as this is. Let's leave it be this. It's a very pure piece. It's very, very um, reductive, but, but it gains its power from that, from that extreme simplicity. So clearly, sculpture is no longer only about carving wood, chiseling stone, or modeling clay. The artist Barty Kerr, who has developed her use of the found object for the past 20 years, beautifully defines what sculpture is to her. But sculpture is really about holding a moment in time. And you have to almost, all your preparations mean everything and absolutely nothing So to the work. It's because really what you're doing is you're creating a space, an object in, in space, and you're asking people to experience, I don't know, what is it, that, a, a moment that you have created, and then from that they will create, they'll create their own experience. It's, it's... Okay, we're gonna take a short break right now, but when we come back, we're gonna meet Ellen Talor and some other sculptors working in this way. Talor especially uses some rather bizarre found objects in his work. So don't miss out.